Okay, hello everyone. This is the first lecture of uh, geographic applications of remote sensing. And I'm going to give you a general in introduction to remote sensing. I know that most of you do not have a background of remote sensing, uh, have, have, have never done anything uh, related to remote sensing. Uh, it's okay. I mean, this is an entering level remote sensing class. Okay, okay, let's get started. So um, I'm going to introduce the definition of remote sensing first, actually definitions, okay? Um, and then uh, the general process of remote sensing, how uh, sensors in the sky collect data, okay? Then I'm going to use a lot of images to give you uh, a general um, impression of the history of remote sensing development. And then uh, I will use several slides to, 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 to introduce several applications of, now, of remote sensing. I'm not going to go deep uh, for any part of this lecture. So it's a very general introduction. Okay, let's get started. So definition of remote sensing. So we have maximum definition and minimum definition of remote sensing. By minimum definition, remote sensing is the non-contact acquisition of information about an object, area, or phenomenon from electromagnetic spectrum or electromagnetic radiation. Usually we say EMR, that's electromagnetic radiation with sensors mounted on different platforms. So several keywords here. Firstly, non-contact, which means that uh, the sensor does not touch uh, the object we're interested in, okay? Then the media. The media is electromagnetic radiation or a part of electromagnetic spectrum. That's our media. We use EMR to collect information from the object we're interested in, okay? Of course, sensor here is a leading character, okay? Sensor is a tool uh, we use to collect information. And sensor can be mounted on different platforms. This sensor can be mounted on a car, okay? On a car, can be mounted on a drone, an aircraft, or even a satellite. So non-contact using EMR, sensors, sensors are tools, okay? Sensors are using EMR as media to do non-contact information collection. And sensors are mounted on different platforms. This minimum definition is actually the definition we use in this class, right? In this class, we talk about sensors, we talk about uh, different types of remote sensing, we talk about how uh, the, the process of collecting data and how to process them, okay? So actually in this class, we're using the minimum, minimal definition, but there is maximal definition. If we are talking about remote sensing uh, with, a, uh, with a much larger context, remote sensing is actually the acquisition of information about an object, area, or phenomenon without touching it. So non-contact equals without touching it, right? That's the core concept of remote sensing. So you don't have to use specific uh, sensors. You don't have to uh, necessarily use EMR. Your sensors, um, I mean, they're usually mounted on a, a platform, but you should know that. Sensors, when we're talking about that, uh, in this class, they equal cameras or CCDs. But actually in our real life, by this maximal definition, remote sensing is everywhere. You just don't know that. For example, uh, five senses of human beings. Firstly, sight. Is sight a type of remote sensing or our eye system, is, uh, is it a part of remote, is it a type of remote sensing? I would say yes, because when you're looking at a specific object, you get the information of it, shape, color, texture, etc. But your eyeballs 
never touch that object you are you are looking at right you are actually collecting information using your eyes your eyes are actually sensors here and uh, what's the media the media is still emr because visible light is a part of electromagnetic spectrum right so your our eye system is actually a remote sensing system by this maximal definition since we're talking about five senses sight is remote sensing um how about taste taste is not remote sensing right because when you taste something you you have to put it in your mouth so there is touching how about hearing hearing is also remote sensing because when the reason you can hear something is that that object is vibrating and that vibration can be uh, conveyed by the vibration of air so a drum a drum is vibrating right and then the surrounding air will also be vibrating and the, the air will just convey that vibration from that drum and your, your 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 ears can hear them so your ears never touch that drum right so it's remote sensing so um taste is not remote sensing touching of course is not remote sensing right so what's the last one the last one is is smell smell is not remote sensing although you never touch the food the cake which smells good but actually uh, why can you smell the the the, the good uh the smell of that cake because um uh, molecules with that smell they are flying they're floating in the air okay and when they arrive in, uh, at your nose go inside of your nose you can smell that uh, smell that specific um, uh, flavor no flavor scent okay the scent a specific scent so five senses among five senses a uh, sight is remote sensing right hearing is remote sensing mm, uh, taste is not remote sensing touch is not remote sensing smell is not remote sensing so you can say that remote sensing is actually everywhere in our life okay but in this class we're talking about the remote sensing by this minimal definition okay we're using specific sensors designed and manufactured by by by, by scientists by factories and we mount we mount them on different platforms to actually collect um information without uh, touching the object on the ground using emr or using a part of um, electromagnetic spectrum okay okay and then remote sensing is highly interdisciplinary which means uh, remote sensing is a combination of a, lo a lot of things right we need to use sensors what are sensors in order to design sensors in order to uh, to 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 manufacture sensors we need knowledge from physics specifically uh we we need to use uh optics knowledge from optics we also need to know knowledge about engineering right that's that's the very beginning of remote sensing we need sensors then we have the sensor then we need to 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 do what to launch it to the sky that's all about engineering right when you're trying to launch launch a satellite into the space that's that's that, that's engineering and when you're trying to use remote sensing to address real world problems that problem could be uh could be um biological issues for example um the biomass of a specific type of plant on the ground and biomass is a uh, is a is a main indicator of the health of plants okay that's bioscience. And also maybe you care about the expansion of cities. That's social science. Because when we're talking about urban planning, when we're talking about how people feel in summer uh, in a city, there is, it's, it's social science. It's about people's feeling and people's response. When you are feeling very hot in urban area, that's because there is something called urban heat island.
and we can use remote sensing technology to address that. So remote sensing is based on a lot of uh, a lot of types of sciences, or you can say it's based on a lot of disciplines, and it can be used in different realms. So I would say remote sensing is not science. You, I would like to consider remote sensing as a toolbox. Okay, we need to address to fix a problem to address a specific issue. You pick a tool from this toolbox of remote sensing and you use it to 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 get work done. That's it. Remote sensing is more like a toolbox instead of a science or engineering. It's a little bit of a lot of things. Okay. So there are different types of remote sensing and we can categorize different types of remote sensing uh, using different principles. When we are using energy, when we are uh, trying to categorize remote sensing by energy source, there are passive remote sensing and active remote sensing. Passive remote sensing is also called optical remote sensing. Okay, uh, so it uses sun as an energy source. And uh, when we're talking about active remote sensing or microwave remote sensing, sensor itself is the energy source. And in this class, we're going to actually talk about passive or optical remote sensing. I'm going to introduce a little bit microwave remote sensing or active remote sensing, but this is just not the core of the course. In this course, we're actually talking about passive or optical remote sensing. So we can also differentiate different types of remote sensing using platforms, okay? If the sensor is mounted on a drone, an aircraft, it's called aerial remote sensing. If the sensor is mounted on a satellite or a spaceship, it's called satellite remote sensing. Oh, let's just say satellite. Okay, uh, is mounted on satellite. It's satellite remote sensing, and by application, this one is more complex. It depends on the realm you are interested in. If you are interested in remote sensing to um, in, in using remote sensing to address um, the, the 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 biomass or abundance of vegetation, we're talking about vegetation remote sensing. If you want to use remote sensing, let's just call it RS, okay? If you want to use RS to address um, water pollution or the temperature of surface temperature of the ocean, we're talking about water body RS. Of course, you can use RS uh, to address the, 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 the health of uh, crops. That's agricultural remote sensing, right? I also mentioned that remote sensing can be uh, applied in urbanized areas to address the expansion of the city or uh, the surface temperature of the city that's urban remote sensing so you can you can you can you can just um find more and more examples right as long as um remote sensing can be used to address your problem that could be a new category a new application of remote sensing okay so by energy source by platform, by application, um, remote sensing can be very complex. But you should know there is overlap. For example, uh, I'm using passive remote sensing to, to address vegetation issue using a sensor mounted on a plane. So uh, what is this remote sensing? This is a passive aerial vegetation remote sensing okay so you should know um, using different methods to category remote sensing uh, uh, is it doesn't mean that you can only choose one of them to describe your remote sensing okay it could be uh, three of them okay okay so this is a general a physical process of actually passive remote sensing because here sound is the energy source Okay, so at the very beginning, sun emits uh, EMR, electromagnetic radiation, right? And it travels to, to, to the Earth and uh, ref get ref gets reflected by the object you are interested in, right? And then what? 
and then the reflected energy is collected is collected by this sensor this sensor is looking at this object so the energy reflected by this object can be collected by this sensor okay so when sensor a gets the information needed it can just just transmit the information back to the ground to a, a satellite station or to another sensor but eventually uh, the ground station will uh, collect the data um, that acquired by this by by the sensor a and as a user we can use the data we can process the data to do analysis and we can find some facts about this target so this is a very general but um i would say a very accurate process of passive remote sensing okay uh, now you don't have to say memorize each step here but yeah I, you should have this impression about the physical process of uh, passive remote sensing. And when we're using a remote sensing, there is also logical process. And this process is not exclusive to remote sensing, right? It, it is actually everywhere when we're, talk, when we're trying to use scientific um, technology or scientific knowledge to address things. So the first step is always the statement of the problem. Okay, so um, I think that the forest here is not going very well these years. Maybe there is some kind of past. Um, they are they are eating up the forest, and I want to know the exact change of biomass of this forest during the last several years. Okay, that's a problem, for example, and then we can collect data using sensors. Right. Um, uh, for example, we can use Landsat, a uh, Landsat archived data to address this problem. It's for free. You can download the, the the remote sensing images for this specific forest in the last several years. Right. And then data to information conversion. Uh, since we have remote sensing images of this forest we're interested in. We can simply use uh, NDVI or even other more complex indicators of um, vegetation biomass to address the change of biomass during the last several years, right? And then information presentation. Since we have the biomass of the forest in the last several years, we can clearly say if the biomass decreased or increased during the last several years, right? Then we can say, okay, if the fact if if it was the fact that this forest is dying if the biomass is decreasing and decreasing dramatically i mean gradually in the last several years uh, i mean it means that my hypothesis was actually partially true the forest is dying but is it because a specific type of pest we're not sure about that of course you can do more work to find out um, uh, 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 the reason for this decreasing of biomass for, for the bad condition of this forest health. But that's an, another problem. At least uh, after this process, you know that, okay, the biomass of this forest decreased maybe gradually or dramatically in the last several years. There is something wrong with this, um, this forest. Okay, so this is a logical process. And uh, I used a remote sensing application example but like i said it's it's a general logical process of of all scientific activities okay or all scientific uh, studies okay so history of remote sensing here comes the interesting part so at the very beginning um people use kites uh balloons or even birds to do remote sensing to observe the ground from above this is an image of a balloon called Intrepid. You can say there is a person here, right? So in 1862, during the Civil War of US, the Union Army tried to utilize balloon photography for tactical reconnaissance, right? It, it, it's natural if you can observe the battleground uh, from above or you can just fly over your enemies um, 
camp area or their area, you can collect more information from above and uh, uh, it's safer, it's safer, right? It's at least it's safer than sending people uh, directly go into enemy's uh, area, right? Okay, and then um, this is an image uh, taken by a kite, a kite, late 1880s. Uh, here is a person, his name is Arthur Babjut. Looks like a very rich person because uh, back in 19th century, I don't think poor people uh, had the money or later time to do scientific research like this or ex experiment. So you can see here is the kite. Obviously here is a camera, this small black box, right? Uh, over a French city. So here is the city. You can see um, it's fairly clear. We can say here is a river. Uh, the, this is a bank on the left side, a dark area. I suppose uh, this dark area is occupied by, by, by by vegetation and we have buildings we can see there is a bridge here right on the right side we still have um, a lot of buildings there so this is a remote sensing image so actually um you're you're doing remote sensing every day when when you use your uh, cell phone to take a picture it's remote sensing it's remote sensing okay then here uh, homing pigeons were trained to carry out aerial reconnaissance in world war one and two so here is the image of a oblique aerial photograph of a european castle obtained from a camera mounted on a carrier pigeon so you can hear you can see here we have a we have wings of this pigeon and uh, here is a badass pigeon here right Pigeon with German miniature camera, probably during the first or the second world war. So you can say here is a jacket of this pigeon and here is a camera. Here is the camera. And uh, yeah, it's a Nazi pigeon. <laughs> okay, it's a Nazi pigeon. And then we have uh, Wright Brothers first flight um, at the very beginning of 20th century. Uh, it brought aerial remote sensing into a new era because now we can use very stable aircraft to mount our camera and people can be on that aircraft to, to decide when to take a picture or an image. When you use a pigeon, when you use a kite, um, it's not very convenient for you to control when to take the picture, right? But now we have aircrafts, okay? so. Of course, of course, we're human beings. When we invent something, we use it mostly for wars, okay? Aerial photogra uh, photo photography played a decisive role as a technical reconnaissance tool during World War I and World War II, okay? It's a totally new era when people, when soldiers, when those generals, they can collect information of large area from sky everything is clear so it's much more convenient for them to 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 make decisions okay so today even today uh, the event the ultimate purpose of remote sensing applications is what is make decisions is to support other people to make decisions okay so uh 1950s and uh, to 60s what was that era famous for Cold War, right? For example, the Cuban Missile Crisis, a uh, high altitude aerial phot photogra photogra photographs uh, from U-2 aircraft documented the, the, the emplacement of Soviet Union medium range ballistic missiles in Cuba. Uh, I'm not sure if you know that, but uh, this crisis nearly annihilated the whole human civilization so here is the image uh, taken by this u2 aircraft so everything here is clear we have tent areas for personnel right uh, equipment maybe military equipment and uh, uh, launcher equipment missile trailers which means here this linear feature is actually a missile on a trailer and here is an oblique even more clear a photo of the area of the military area. Uh, see, here is a missile shelter tent, right? So you can see air, uh, 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 
uh, air reconnaissance is very important in military applications. And uh, this was an image taken in Cold War. It's very clear. Even we can see that uh, there are trucks, right? Tent, a uh, cable, and maybe missile, a missile or several missiles are inside this tent. So you can imagine today. So remote sensing can be applied in civil areas or in military areas. But today you can imagine that nothing can escape from auto sensors from the sky, especially when we're talking about uh, military applications. Okay. And uh, in 1957, um, Sputnik 1, that's the first man made satellite to orbit the Earth, was launched by Soviet Union. Uh, and naturally, we have a new platform for remote sensors, which is satellite. Right, and then um, in 1960, the first successful Corona uh, flight covered more than 1.65 million square miles of Soviet territory and produced 3,000 feet of film. Back then, there was no digital camera, so everything was recorded on on, on films. Right. So uh, the first Corona photo showed a Soviet air base on the shores of the Arctic Ocean. So parking apron, right? And a runway, and a runway. So it's very important. When there is a war, usually the first targets, uh, one of the first targets should be airports, right? You should, you should just destroy all those runways so enemy's plane cannot take off. It's a huge advantage. So, um, I mean, um, Funding out the positions of all those air, airports are pretty important. Okay, is is pretty important. And here is another early Corona image, um, uh, image of Pentagon. So early Corona images has resolutions from twenty five to forty feet. So it's very clear. It's very clear even during the World War. Okay, and later Corona images had a resolution about six feet. Huh. That's that's very uh, clear, which means that uh, uh, if there is a small car on the ground, okay, you can just tell the model and 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 what and the brand of the car, okay. And after the Cold War, I would say um, people um, began to use satellites for more meaningful things. For example, land resources, vegetation. Uh, soil, uh, uh, rivers, right, and glaciers, etc. So ERTS-1, um, it was later renamed as Landsat-1. It's, uh, it's one of the most famous satellites in remote sensing realm. I'm going to introduce its family later in this class, okay, maybe next week or the week after next week. And then we have uh, ERTS-1 or Landsat family, they are for land uh, resources. And then NOAA-6 was launched, okay? Um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of USA. So their satellites, some of their satellites, they are actually named after their own name, NOAA. So this, uh, this satellite was, for, was mainly for climate and weather. Yeah, and then um, uh, we have uh, we have CSAT is the beginning of radar or active remote sensing, right? Which means that uh, the CSAT sensor itself is the energy source of of this whole process of remote sensing. Uh, and then uh, from Europe we have Sport family, France uh, launched long, long Sport one in 1986. Sport family is also very famous. It's not there anymore, but we always compare Sport family uh, with, with, with Landsat family, okay? Because they are very similar to each other in terms of their purposes, okay? Uh, in terms of their um, specific um, specs, for example, spatial resolution, uh, spectral resolution, and, uh, and, uh, and, and band sets, okay? And then um, around 2000, around 2000. So uh, in 1999, a very famous 
sensor or you could say a, a satellite iconos is actually um the name of that satellite the sensor can also be considered as with the same name iconos was launched and uh, it can be and it can be considered as 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 a very successful uh example of commercial satellite industry okay because uh iconos was not is not owned by government or any country it, it is owned by a specific company it's called gi the first commercial high resolution satellite civil satellite okay one meter panchromatic and four meter multispectral imagery okay was launched and the same year nasa launched the terra uh, space aircraft with ca uh, which carries five separate earth resources sensors aster uh, aster is very famous uh, the rest of them modis is also very famous it's uh, it it is widely used and it can be considered as uh, as the beginning of something called hyperspectral remote sensing uh, it's not that hyper but modis has multiple bands more multiple more bands than other traditional uh, sensors or satellites okay and here here is an image of one meter resolution iconos image of pentagon of pentagon okay taken at a specific time it's right after that terrorist attack you can say a part of the building was crushed was uh, was assaulted was crushed was hit by an airplane by an airplane and uh, then we have more and more high spatial resolution commercial satellites. Uh, QuickBird, also very famous. So here is an uh, image of, of Washington DC, of Washington DC. And uh, World Wheel 4, okay. Here is an image taken by World Wheel 4. It's an urbanized area. So you can say everything here is very clear. We have tree canopies. We have a parking lot here, I think. Uh, maybe it's the top of a building. Ah, it's a top of building because we, I, I can see shadow here. And here is, uh, is the wall of the building, right? We can say road, we can say roads, actually. Uh, even the logo on the top of the building can be recognized, right? Even small houses, small buildings can be recognized. Those red um, squares, they're actually um, roofs of small buildings. Okay, and let's talk about applications of remote sensing in a very general fashion. So agriculture, we can use remote sensing to do yield estimation, for example, soil being core and weight. And uh, I'm not sure if you know, soil being core and weight, they are strategic food for, uh, for all countries to secure food security. And they are also, uh, they're called large bug community. I think that's the name. Um, in Wall Street, on Wall Street. So it means that you can use remote sensing to, to do what? To estimate the yield of this commodities and use them to earn money because it's a part of Wall Street, okay? There are stocks and uh, something called future for them. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not. I'm not very sure about that. But I know that yield estimation of agro agriculture crops is doable. Is absolutely doable with remote sensing. Okay, soil properties or soil inventory. This is ve also very important for agriculture. Right, growth monitoring of crops. If they are doing well, if they are not doing well, and there is health um, issues so we can address them okay water management water management and um, here is a very easy classification for agriculture on the left side we have a part of the image uh, mainly occupied by two colors red and green okay so red in a remote sensing image with false color usually represents vegetation. So here is the area mainly occupied by vegetation. And the green area here is 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 what? Is 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 I think 
it should be bare soil, but I'm not sure because I'm not the I'm not the person who did this classification. What I'm sure is that the red is vegetation. Okay, so uh, you can you can you can easily tell the distribution, spatial distribution of vegetation or crops, or or a forest or natural uh, vegetation. There is spatial distribution, and on the right side, <clears throat> we have two. Uh, reflectance curves. What does it mean? It means different objects on the ground. They reflect different parts of the uh, of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum with different abilities. For example, you can say that uh, the green line here, the green curve here, is the reflectance curve of cotton canopy. So vegetation, right? You can see that uh, from 300 to 700 nanometer, this is wavelength, wavelength of EMR. A vegetation has very low reflectance. Here is a peak, but still very low. It's, it's, it's lower than 0 0.1. It means that uh, the electromagnetic radiation within this range, 300 to 700 nanometer range, uh, the energy with this range, is barely reflected by the vegetation. Only less than 10% of the energy is reflected by vegetation. But how about later? Above 700 meter, uh, 700 nanometer, the reflectance of the, uh, of the vegetation increased dramatically. So this very steep cliff here is the signature is a signature of vegetation in terms of reflectance. And it's very different from other curves. For example, uh, this brown line, this brown curve is the reflectance of bare soil. It's very stable compared to this green curve, right? So there is no huge, right, steep cliff here along this curve of bare soil. So this is actually a, a signature, we call it spectral signature for vegetation. And we can use it to identify a, a vegetation. And um, we can, if I get the spectral reflectance spectral curve of this object, of, a, of an unknown object, and it's very, the, the shape of the cur this curve is very close to this green curve, I can be 100% sure that that object is a vegetation. This is just like a fingerprint. Everyone has its, uh, its own fingerprint, right? It's similar in remote sensing. Every land cover type or specifically every material or every type of object on the ground has its own reflectance spectral curve. And we can use this curve to tell the specific land cover type or the specific um, object to tell what it is. Is it bare soil? Is it vegetation? Is it glass? Is it um, metal? So here is just a, a very simple example. So using this chart, we can differentiate soil and crop canopy. Okay, because there is huge difference in terms of the shapes of these two curves. Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, the, the red area, like I said, is vegetation, right? Um, the green area could be soil, could be soil. And then we can, we can use remote sensing to address something called urban heat island. Um, usually we know that the temperature of urbanized area is higher than the surrounding uh, rural areas. Why? Because the materials we use in urban areas, uh, they are pretty good at what? Storing thermal energy, for example, concrete, um, asphalt, and uh, metal, uh, uh, many other things, many other materials. They're pretty good at that. So uh, usually the air temperature and surface temperature of uh, urbanized area is higher than surrounding rural areas. And we can use remote sensing to retrieve the information of temperature, specifically land surface temperature, right? So here is a, a figure from my 
uh, PhD dissertation, right? Um, so it's a grayscale image, um, and uh, here is the legend. If the pixel or a specific area in this image is very bright, it means uh, the surface temperature is pretty high. If it is dark, it's pretty low. So we can see here we have a very bright area on the right side. It's actually the uh, Milwaukee city in Wisconsin. Okay, you can say uh, the, the, uh, the linear feature here, uh, linear features here, they are rows, right? And we have uh, patchy features here. They are actually uh, downtown area and buildings. And the surrounding areas um, have relatively lower temperature because you can say uh, they are relatively darker than this uh, urbanized area, okay? And here um, is the abundance of impervious surface. Uh, impervious surface includes um, concrete, uh, asphalt, metal, glass, all those materials I mentioned before, who are responsible for air high temperature in urbanized areas, right? So you can, if you compare these two, on the right side, we have the abundance of impervious surface. It's in percentage. If an area is pretty high, it means that that area is uh, mostly occupied by impervious surface or all those uh, materials, man-made materials we use uh, in urbanized area. So if you compare the left side and right side, right, um, you can see there is very high positive correlation between land surface temperature and percentage ISA. It means that, okay, these materials, they are responsible for land surface temperature, okay? lower uh, percentage ISA, lower temperature, higher percentage ISA, higher temperature. And also uh, we can use remote sensing images to, 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 to monitor urban growth, okay? Oh, we can simply use classification, a specific classification method to differentiate urbanized areas and the rural areas. And uh, uh, we can calculate the area of urbanized air, uh, calculate the size of urbanized areas. And then we do something called temporal analysis, which means uh, we take a picture for the same area in different years, right? 1973, 1999. This, this is another image, 2030. Okay, this is a projection. And the red area is classified as urbanized area. So you can say it's like a plague or it's like a scar, uh, um, a spending scar, right? Area, red area here is very small, become larger, and it is projected, it is predicted to become even larger in the next um, decades, in the next decade, okay? And then we can even use remote sensing to estimate population. For example, here is a complex building compound, right? We have roads, we have buildings, large buildings, small buildings. And uh, based on ancillary data, for example, your experience or some urban planning data from local administration, you can differentiate different, uh, uh, you can differentiate different uh, types of buildings here. Some of them, for example, here, they are apartments, which means that there are people living inside. Some of these areas, they are garage, their garage, which means there is no people living in, it's just cars. So if we can differentiate different types of buildings and we can estimate the average number of people living in each apartment within this area, then we can actually estimate the population of this area, right? Okay, so this is another application of remote sensing in social science. Demography, okay? We know application, we can do a lot of things. Socioeconomic things. A lot of problems can be addressed. And then of ecological studies, for example, the surface temperature of oceans, okay? And also monitoring wildfire, okay? Because um, in thermal band, uh, all those wildfire points, they are 
because they're emitting a lot of thermal energy, so they are highlight. They can be easily highlighted um, uh, in, in in thermal images. Okay, and also we can monitor the, the air pollution. Uh, PM two point five is very famous today, especially in developing countries. It used to be a problem in US and Great Britain, maybe last century, uh, in the middle or the beginning of last century. But uh, US and uh, Great Britain, they are developed countries now. So uh, all those highly polluted factories, they are basically now in China, in East Asia and South Asia. So uh, air pollution is a pretty big problem for local governments. And we can use remote sensing uh, to monitor uh, particles, for example, 2.5, uh, PM 2.5 or PM 10, which means uh, particles uh, around 10 micrometers diameter. And uh, we can do something like this on the left side, right? Um, or on the right side, it's a very accurate spatial distribution of the concentration of PM 2.5, okay? Okay, um, this video is long enough. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is the first lecture and it's for the general introduction of remote sensing. A lot of uh, aspects of remote sensing I mentioned in this lecture will be discussed in detail later this semester, okay? So after this lecture, um, um, as long as you now have a general impression and idea of remote sensing, you're good. Okay? Okay, I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you.